The door bursts open. The cold whistles in. Your foot is grabbed and you're pulled from the bed to the ground. You're ordered to get up. You're weak. I can't do this too much longer. He enters, scanning the room at the frail, broken corpses. You are not human anymore. You are the walking dead. A smirk crosses his cold grey face. Him, him, him and him. His skeleton finger of death points at you. Forcefully, you're taken to his experiment lair. Here, the baths were already full. Steam rising from stun. Stood over one, you feel the heat radiating. A cold claw grasps the back of your neck. Pressure and down, you go for face first. The heat of the water numbs at first and then burns. Instinct kicks in. You fight, trying to get out, to breathe. Pulled up, you inhale as much as you could and then you're forced back down. You got glimpses of him, smiling, even laughing. Finally, you're released, only to do it all again in a bath of ice. This goes on for hours. All the while, he watches, smiling, laughing, taunting. This was Joseph Miguel, the ice witch angel of death. And this is the good, the bad, and the pure evil. Born 16th of March 1911, his father was founder of Carl Mingle and Sons, which produced farming machinery. Yosef was good at school, interested in music, art and skiing. He finished school in April 1931 and went on to study philosophy in Munich, where it just so happened was also where the Nazi party was. In 1935, he earned a PhD in anthropology. January 1937, he joined the Institute for Hereditary, Biological and Racial Hygiene in Frankfurt. Here he worked for Artmorn Freiherr von Verschur, who was a German geneticist with a big interest in the research of twins. As Artmorn's assistant, Josef focused on genetic factors that caused cleft lips and palates or cleft chin. His thesis on this earned him an MD from the University of Frankfurt in 1938. All these degrees would be taken back by the universities in the 60s, when it was found out what Yosef had done. Otmar would send letters of recommendation saying Yosef was reliable and able to clearly present complex material. July 1939, Josef married Irene Schuttenbrunn after meeting her while working as a medical resident. They had one child, a son named Rolf, in 1944. Josef in 1937 joined the Nazi party and then in 1938 joined the Schutzstaffel or SS protection. Also in 1938, the Gebirgsjäger, who were lightly infantry mountain troops, they gave Josef basic training. He was then called to service in Vokmark, a Nazi army force, in June 1940. From this, he soon volunteered for medical service in the Waffen SS, which was the combat arm of the SS. Here he served with the rank SS Second Lieutenant in the Medical Reserve until November 1940. He was then assigned to the SS Race and Settlement Main Office where he evaluated candidates for formalization. In June 1941, Yosef was now posted at Ukraine. Here he was awarded the Iron Cross Second Class. Six months later, January 1942, he joined the 5th SS Panzer Division of Viking as a battalion medical officer. While here, he rescued two German soldiers from a burning tank. From this, he was decorated with the Iron Cross First Class 
the wound badge in black and the medal for the care of the German people. Josef was badly injured mid-1942 and was declared unfit to continue service. Once he recovered, he was moved to the headquarters of the SS Race and Settlement main office in Berlin. Here he started back working with Ottmar, who at the time was director of the Kaiser Welven Institution of Anthropology, Human Hereditary and Eugenics. By April 1943, Josef was promoted to captain. Auschwitz II, Berkenu, was to house slave labourers, but in 1942 began to do a labour camp and an extermination camp. Prisoners came daily by rail from all over Nazi-controlled Europe. From July 1942, SS doctors were doing selections. Jews would come in and would be split up. Those who could work went into the camps, while those thought to be unfit were taken immediately to be killed in the gas chambers. About three thirds of those who arrived were selected to die. The groups to die included children, women with small children, pregnant women, the elderly, and those declared by the SS as unfit or unhealthy. Early 1943, Atmar spoke to Yosef and advised him to apply for a transfer to concentration camp service. Yosef did as advised and his application was accepted for Auschwitz. He was appointed the chief position of the Romy family camp in Berknia, a sub-camp on the Auschwitz complex. At Auschwitz, SS doctors didn't give treatment to the inmates. Instead, they supervised activities of the inmate doctors, who were forced to work in the camp medical service. Josef's duties included weekly visits to the hospital barracks, and he would have any prisoners who didn't recover in two weeks sent to the gas chambers. Josef also carried out selections. He chose to do this, even when he wasn't assigned to. He did this in hopes to find subjects for his experiments. He particularly wanted to find twins. Most SS doctors didn't like being assigned selection. They found it very stressful and not nice to complete. But Yosef, he loved it. Becoming excited to do it, often smiling or whistling as he carried it out. Yosef was one of the SS doctors involved in the supervising and administration of Selkalon B, the cyanide pesticide that was used to kill large groups in the Bernica gas chambers. An outbreak of Noma, a gangrious bacterial disease of the mouth and face, hit the Romani camp in 1943. Yosef began a study to find out the cause and develop a treatment. Yosef had a prisoner, Berthold Epstein, assist. He was a Jewish paediatrician and a professor at Prague University. The patients infected were separated. Several children infected were killed. Their heads and organs were sent to the SS Medical Academy. This research was still happening even when the camps was liquidated and those who remained were killed in 1944. Typhus would break out in the women's camp. Yosef cleared a block of 600 Jewish women, sending them to the gas chambers. The building was then cleaned and disinfected. Those next door were bathed, deloused, given new clothes and moved into the clean block. This was repeated until all the barracks was disinfected. This procedure would also be used when scarlet fever and other diseases broke out were prisoners affected being gassed. For this, Yosef was awarded the War Merit Cross and in 1944 was promoted to first physician. Yosef would see Auschwitz as an opportunity to continue his anthropology studies and research into hereditary. He did this by using inmates for human experiments. What he did showed no consideration for his victim's health, safety, or physical and emotional suffering. 
He sought for twins, preferably identical. People with two different eye colours and those with dwarfism and people with noticeably abnormalities. Otmar would organise a grant from the German Research Foundation. They would get reports and shipments of specimen from Josef. With the grant, Josef built a pathology lab attached to the crematorium 2 at Auschwitz. May 29, 1944, Miklas Nyselis, a Hungarian Jewish pathologist, arrived at Auschwitz. He would be used to complete dissections and prepare specimens for shipment in the new lab. The twin research aimed to prove supremacy of hereditary. This approval would strengthen the Nazi theory of the genetic superiority of the Aryan race. Michaelis and others thought there was more than to the twin study. They believed it was motivated by an intention to increase the reproduction rate of the German race. This would be achieved by having the perfect people having twins. When Josef chose his victims, they were spared for a moment from the gas chambers. They would be fed better and housed better than any other prisoners. To the children, he called himself Uncle Miguel and came bearing sweets. At the same time, to many, he was executioner with lethal injections, shootings, beatings and horrific experiments all ending in death. He was described as, as sadistic with little to no empathy. He was known to be extremely anti-Semitic, truly believing Jews should be eliminated as an inferior and dangerous race. Even his son, Rolf, said his father showed no remorse for his wartime activities. An inmate doctor would say, quote, Joseph was capable of being so kind to the children, to have them become fond of him, to bring them sugar, to think of small details in their daily lives, and to do things we would genuinely admire. And then, next to that, the crematorious smoke. And these children, tomorrow or in half an hour, he is going to send them there. Well, that is where the anatomy lay." End quote. With the twins, they had weekly examinations by Yosef or an assistant. He would cut off the twins' limbs, purposely infecting a twin with a disease and transfusing the blood of one to another. Many died from these, and those who didn't were sometimes killed and dissected once Yosef didn't need them anymore. Michaelis remarked Yosef once killed 14 twins in just one night by injecting chloroform into their hearts. If one died and not the other, he killed them to get comparative autopsy reports for research purposes. Yosef did eye experiments and these included trying to change the colour by injecting chemicals into the eyes of the victims. Those who naturally had two different eye colours, he killed, removed their eyes and sent them to Berlin for study. On those with dwarfism or physical abnormalities, he took measurements drew blood, pulled healthy teeth, did x-rays and gave drugs that weren't needed. Many of his victims were sent to the gas chambers within two weeks and their remains were sent to Berlin for examination. Josef would also experiment on pregnant women, sending them to the gas chambers after. Alex Deckel would survive and gave reports Josef did Vivisection, with no anesthesia, removing hearts and stomachs of the victims. Yitzhak Gannon was one such patient. He reported Yosef removed his kidney with no anesthesia. Yitzhak was also made to go back to work with no pain relief. Vera Alexander witnessed Yosef sew two Romani twins together back to back as some sort of horrible conjoint twin experiment. Sadly, both children died of gangrene days later. January 1945, Josef, along with other Auschwitz doctors, 
were moved to Grasshausen camp. Joseph took two boxes of specimens and records of his experiments with him. Most of the camp medical records were destroyed by the SS by the time the Red Army liberated Auschwitz, January 27th. February 18th, Josef fled Grasswassen. A week later, the Soviets arrived. He travelled to Satek, disguised as a Vornach officer rather than SS. Here, he became touchy friendly with a nurse, who he entrusted his incriminating documents with. He continued west with his unit to avoid the Soviets, but June 1945, the US captured him as a prisoner of war. Yosef actually gave his name, but wasn't thought to be a major player, as he wasn't on any wanted list then, and didn't have the usual SS blood group tattoo. The US released him the end of July, and he got false papers with the name Fritz Ullmann Later, it was Fritz Hallmann. On the run, Josef went back to get his documents from the nurse. He found work near Vossim as a farmhand. April 17, 1949, Josef managed to escape Germany. He was convinced if caught, he would be trialled and put to death for what he did. Helped by former SS members, he used a rat line a system of escape routes for Nazis in the aftermath of World War II. He travelled to Genoa. Here he got a passport from the International Committee of the Red Cross under the name Helmut Gregor. July 1945, he sailed to Argentina. His wife Irene refused to go and she divorced him in 1954. In Argentina, Yosef worked as a carpenter in Buenos Aires. Within weeks, he moved to Florida Este. He lived in a house of a Nazi sympathizer and worked as a salesman for his family's farm equipment company, Carl Mengel and Sons. 1951, he would go back and forth to Paraguay as the regional sales representative. 1953, he moved back to Beno Aires and used family money into a carpentry business. In 1954, he rented a house in Olivas. In 1992, the Argentina government released files on Josef, which showed he may have been practicing medicine without a license while in Buenos Aires, and these practices included performing abortions. Josef was able to get a copy of his birth cert from the West Germany Embassy in 1956. He then got an Argentine foreign residency permit using his real name. From this he got a West German passport again using his real name and went on a trip to Europe. He met up with his son Rolf introducing himself as Uncle Fritz. He also met his brother's widow Marta for a skiing trip in Switzerland. He would also spend a week in his hometown, Gunzburg. He came back to Argentina September 1956 and began living using his real name. Now, Marta and her son came in October and they began living with Josef. Josef and Marta became close and they married in 1958 while had holidays in Uruguay and they bought a house in Breno Aires. Yosef, now part owner of Fadro Farm, Farm, a pharmaceutical company, in 1958, he, along with other doctors, were questioned on suspicion of practicing medicine without a license when a teen died during an abortion. Yosef was released without charge. Knowing the publicity could possibly lead to his Nazi past and wartime crimes being found out, he would go to Paraguay for a bit and got citizenship in 1959 with the name Jose Mengel. He went back to Buenos Aires many times settling business stuff and visiting family. Marta and Carl lived in the city until December 1960 and then they went to West Germany. During the Nuremberg trials, Josef's name was said many, many times, 
but Allied forces believed he was probably dead. Irene Mangel and Josef's family in Gunzburg all, all said that they believed he was dead. In West Germany were Nazi hunters Simon Weisendahl and Hermann Langbein. A Nazi hunter was one who tracks down and gathers information on alleged Nazis or SS members and Nazi collaborators, typically for use in trials and charges of war crimes. So Weisenthal and Langenbein were collecting information from witnesses about Josef's wartime activities. In their search, they found Josef's divorce papers, which had an address in Buenos Aires. Both men would pressure the West German authorities to start extraditing procedures. June 5th, 1959, an arrest warrant was drawn up. At first, Argentina wouldn't comply, as the fugitive was not the address given. June 30, extradition was approved, but by then, Josef had fled to Paraguay. May 1960, Director of the Israeli Intelligence Agency, Mossad, Isar Harrell, would personally lead the successful capture of Adolf Ekman in Buenos Aires. Ekman was one of the major organisers of the Holocaust. Harrell was hoping to also get Yosef to bring him to trial in Israel. While interrogating Ekman, he provided an address of a boarding home that was a safe house for Nazi fugitives. The house would be surveillance but didn't reveal Yosef or members of his family. Questioning a postman, he claimed Yosef was getting letters under his real name but had since moved with no forwarding address. Harrell would look into a machine shop that Yosef was part owner, but it generated nothing and the search was abandoned. West Germany did give Yosef legal documents using his real name in 1956, but now they were offering a reward for his capture. Newspapers would cover his wartime activities along with photos of him. This would have him relocate again in 1960. Hans Ulrich Rudel would help Josef make contact with the Nazi supporter Wolfgang Gerhard and he helped Josef get into Brazil. Here Josef stayed with Gerhard on his farm near Sao Paulo until he got permanent accommodation with Hungarian expat Giza and Gritta Stammer. This couple, with financial help from Josef, who was given a job as a manager. The three then bought a coffee and cattle farm in 1962 in Serra Negra, with Josef holding 50% interest. The Stammers knew Josef as Peter Hochbuckler until finding out his real name in 1963. When they found out, Gerhard convinced them not to report him. He did this by suggesting they could be seen as protecting a fugitive and also arrested. February 1961, West Germany widened the extradition to include Brazil as they gotten tips about Josef's new location. Sylvie Aharoni, a Mossad agent involved with capturing Ekman, was put in charge of the team to find Josef and bring him to trial. Inquiring in Paraguay yielded no clues and had them failed to intercept communications between Josef and Marta, who now was in Italy. Agents would also follow Rudel, but again this yielded nothing. Aharoni followed Gerhard, and this brought him to a farm near San Paolo, where they seen a European man they believed was Josef. This was huge and reported back to Harlow. But logistics, budget problems and the fact priority was now on the breakdown of relationships with Egypt led the Mossad chief to call off the manhood of Yosef in 1962. Yosef and the Stammers co-bought a farmhouse in 1969 with Yosef 50% owner. Wolfgang Gerhard returned to Germany in 1971 because his wife and child were very ill and needed medical medical treatment. Before leaving, he gave his identity card to Yosef. In 1974, 
Yosu's relationship with the Stammers began to break down after they bought a house in San Paolo and didn't invite Ro Yosef. The Stammers would then buy a bungalow in El Dorado, which they rented out to Yosef. Yosef's son, Rolf, would come visit him in 1977. He hadn't seen his father since the ski trip in 1956. He would say his father saw no wrong do in what he did. He never personally harmed anyone I was carrying out duties and orders. 1972, Yosef's health began to fail. In 1976, he had a stroke, had high blood pressure and ear infections that had him off balance. February 1979, while visiting friends in Pertigo with Wolfgang's identity card, Yosef had another stroke while swimming and drowned. He was buried in Embu das Artes as Wolfgang Gerhard. Sightings would be reported of Josef in Greece, 1960, Cairo, 1961, Spain, 1971, and Paraguay, 1978. Weisenthal, the Nazi hunter, insisted as of late 1985, Josef was alive, six years after he was actually dead. Interests of Yosef across the world came spring 1985, when a mock trial was held in Jerusalem. Testimonies had over 100 victims of Yosef's experiments. From this, West Germany, Israel and the US launched a coordinated effort to find where Yosef was. May 31, 1985, acting on info, police raided the home of Hans Seldemeyer a friend and business colleague of Yosef. Here they found a coded address book and letters sent to and received from Yosef. In amongst the papers was a letter from Mr. Wolfram Bossert, letting Seldemir know Yosef had died. This information was passed to the San Paolo police and they got in contact with the Bosserts. With intense interrogation, they finally gave a location to Yosef's grave. On June 6, 1985, his remains were exhumed. Extensive forensic examination was done, which concluded it was highly likely the body was Yosef, Yosef Mangel. June 10th, his son Rolf confirmed the body was his father and would state the news of his death was hidden to protect those who helped him. In 1992, DNA testing confirmed once and for all the body was Yosef. Brazilian officials would repeatedly request the family to take the remains back to Germany. All requests were refused. Yosef's skeleton now resides at Sa Sao Paulo Institute for Forensic Medicine and is used as an educational aid in forensic medicine courses. Thank you all for listening. Next time I'll look into Adrian Carton D. Wyatt, also known as the Unkillable Soldier. He served in the Boer War, World War I and World War II. He was shot in the face, lost his eye and hand. He was also shot through the skull, hip, leg, ankle and ear. He also survived two plane crashes, tunnel tunneled out of a prisoner of war camp, and even tore off his fingers when doctors refused to amputate. He would become a figure of legends who showed heroism in the highest degree. Until then, this is the good, the bad and the pure evil. <laughs>